Good morning, good morning. Stop by the side of the road here. Get the old video going. What a miserable day. We've had a, it's one of a lot of miserable days we've had with rain. Anyway, how are you? All right? You okay? Good? Glad to hear it. <laughs> it's Friday. I only work in Friday morning. I've got a crown, a crown prep this morning. Then I think an exam with some perio. And then uh, I'm going to, uh, got my cousins coming in for a checkup. And then we're going out for lunch. So, hopefully indoors. Ha! Let me put my lights on, because everyone else has got their lights on. So, what can I talk to you about? Well, <clears throat> there's been a few developments. Obviously, my uh, receptionist ran off to join Border Force. So, she's busy training to be a Border Force agent. Or, actually, I think she's working for one of their self-employed subcontractors, you know, like a Quango that's just in charge with uh, giving them sandwiches and making sure their pillows are, uh, they've got enough pillows and stuff. Um, let's not get the windscreen fogged up. Uh, yeah, so, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm having to compete with uh, government ages, uh, agencies paying £30,000 locally, so you can imagine uh, Mind you, you know, we've got we've got what I think is a very good candidate replacement. So. There's been um, two big things this week. One is a big, um, well, they're all wrapped up in one, really. The, the uh, Conservative Party have, uh, have given details of their plan to rescue NHS dentistry. Which is, you know, I think was a mistake because I think they actually uh, stirred up a hornet's nest there. They, they might have been better off actually just uh, not mentioning it at all rather than coming up with a sort of the flimsy measures they said that they're going to reallocate half of the underspend because dentists are leaving the NHS they've they've underspent the budget so that's allowed them to say that they've got some money that they're going to put into NHS dentistry which amounts to, let's just say in straight money terms, about half the underspend. So they've saved the whole underspend and put back half the underspend and called it extra money. And the reason why that's causing a problem is that um, people are quite rightly saying that you're just recycling the, the dental budget, what you've, what you've saved, and calling it new money. And what they're doing is they're saying, no, it is additional money but obviously it sort of depends on dentists then spending up to the budget. If the dentist spent up to the budget, then they would, they would still have to put the extra 200 million in, at which point it would become extra money, wouldn't it? But I don't know if you can say it's extra money if, if it's come out of an underspent. Seems a bit dishonest to me. It's almost like politicians are dishonest. So, I was quite surprised. Nobody, you know, normally Radio Kent or LBC rings me up and asks me for a comment, but I'm just an old has been now, so they don't really want to know what I think. And uh, so I'm going to tell you. <laughs> You're going to have to sit there and listen to it. First of all, I've got to say, they're not proposing anything that hasn't been tried before. You know, so. This whole idea of uh, making it easier for overseas qualified dentists to work in the UK and for um, dentists to return to the profession after they, they've had babies and uh, all these all these things are old tricks that you know that have been tried and and really maxed out in terms of increasing the workforce. They've proposed to um, boost uh, the income for taking on a new patient by 50 pounds now bearing in mind right the average course of treatment now as as a time of recording is three 
UDAs, which is, and there's 25 pounds of UDA. So we're talking on average 75 pounds, right, for a course of treatment. So that includes the checkup, x ray, scan, and polish, or gum treatment if necessary, over several visits, uh, an unlimited number of fillings, an unlimited number of root treatments, and an unlimited number of extractions, plus, uh, you know, uh, smoothing off teeth, etc., etc. Uh, and so for that, you multiply 25 by 3 and you get uh, 75. So that 75 pounds has to cover all of that. So, and then they wonder why dentists aren't working on the NHS. So what dentists now are going to get for taking on a patient who will almost certainly need all of that is an extra 50 quid. So instead of 75 quid, as I understand it, they're going to get 125 quid. Now this is because dentists, you know, are quite sane and rational people and won't take on patients who haven't seen a dentist for 10 years uh, for 75 quid when they can look after their own patients who they've got dentally fit and healthy uh, for the same money. So the, you know, I just don't think these people just don't understand economics. And if they think that bunging the dentist 50 quid for taking on a patient, you know, and who's got intractable dental disease off the local, uh, uh, I forget what they call them now, commissioning authorities or something, off their waiting list, um, you know, I honestly think we're, we're past that point. And then the other thing is that really in response to the all the people who said, look, these people train at public expense, I don't see why they shouldn't be forced to work for the public. Um, they've decided to offer £20,000 as what they call a golden hello. Now, I don't know. <laughs> this is for working in an in a underserved area for three years. So in fact, it's nearly just uh, under £7,000 a year. Um, so, or, or, or uh, £140 a day, I suppose that works out then. But, <clears throat> again, I wouldn't call that a golden hello. That's, that's a sort of a brass hello, or possibly a bronze hello. But certainly not a golden hello. Um, you know, that's not really going to... This is, bear in mind, this comes on top of their bright idea to put dental schools in areas of high deprivation on the grounds that people who qualified at the dental school and knew the area, fell in love with the cheeky local people and decided to stay there and, and uh, work for nothing to cure their uh, addiction to sweets. Then, they also don't mention the fact that everybody, everybody in the country goes to university at public expense. The only thing, the only people I can say probably don't are pilots. Pilots, there's no uh, university pilot course. But there is, uh, funnily enough, I mean, it would probably be cheaper than the dental course. So I don't see why they don't do it. But everybody's trained at public expense. And therefore, if you want to make the argument that uh, dentists should therefore have some minimum commitment to the NHS, then really you need to be making that argument more generally in favour of, uh, you know, uh, architects and uh, vets and solicitors and all that sort of stuff. Watch this line, watch this line. Um, this is the most, st this is the stupidest line in the world, this line. <laughs> oh. <sighs> so, then, then, I mean, there's the other, um, the Labour Party that said that they're going to uh, create so many hundreds of thousands of new appointments um, without really saying how. I mean, presumably the same thing by, you know, just sort of saying to a dentist, look, if you want to stay late and see half a dozen NHS patients, we'll, um, <clears throat> we'll bung you 50 quid. I don't think what they realise is that they're competing for dentists in the in the private sector. They really they really never understood that. 
that is the crux of the problem that they've got. They, <clears throat> if a dentist's got two choices between doing doing fillings at 140, 130, 140 pounds each in the private sector, or working on the NHS and earning 75 pounds for a complete course of treatment, there's going to be a tremendous osmotic pressure, isn't there, to go privately. I mean, basically, a dentist will go private. He's only restricted by two things. One is the pressure from the patients for a, for a, a, a reasonable private service in the area. Let me just get through the junction of Den. And the other thing is... Um, He's sort of mental birdcage, you know. He's uh, he's uh, <clears throat> the only thing to fear is fear itself. He's he's dependence on being suckered and sucking on the teat of the state, and he's worried that should he decide to uh, try and uh, go private, that he would fail abjectly and uh, lose his NHS contract and his nice car and possibly his nice wife and his nice nurse. So, this, I, oh, I always found when I talked to Barry Cockcroft about this, I've found that they've, they have, or he had, and now they have, sort of a blank spot. The, the time to stop to have solved the problem and to stop the dentist going private would have been right at the beginning when the first dentist said, well, I'm going to be 10% private or 20% private. And the NHS should have turned around and said, well, in that case, we're going to take your NHS contract away from you. And let's see how well you survive on your 20% of your patients going private. Now, I don't think many dentists would have done that. They would have they would have chosen to stay on the NHS. And if it had been, you know, if the Chief Dental Officer had come along and said, it's my way or the highway, then possibly we might not even have had a problem like this. But he didn't. He was totally confident that, that the NHS could compete with the private sector. In fact, he went so far as to say that he thought that dentists in the private sector were making a big mistake and were missing out on a lot, you know, namely the NHS pension, which is crap by the way. And you know, and perhaps possibly even the camaraderie. In fact, they did, they did to private dentists what uh, uh, the European Union did to Britain when we left. You know, they ostracized us. We became non-people. Uh, we weren't, contacted by the local postgraduate centre. We weren't allowed to reclaim our expenses when we went to a postgraduate meeting. Uh, we, we never get newsletters from the Chief Dental Officer because she sees herself as uh, the Chief NHS Dentistry Officer, not, not the Chief Officer, the Chief Dentist. She's just the Chief NHS Dentist. You know, and the British Dental Association, of course, wh wh who negotiated with the uh, terms and conditions with the government, would never uh, put put the meetings, the results of those meetings, in the public domain. They disseminated them to the private, to their members. You know, to the dentists who paid to uh, be members of the British Dental Association, even though the negotiations were being held on behalf of of dentists as a whole. All the dentists in the country were a party to the negotiation, but the, the results and, uh, and the BDA would only accept input from um, the members of what, what is effectively a, a private, you know, like limited type company. It's a bit like uh, FINRA in the United States. If you want to be a stockbroker, you have to be a member of FINRA even though FINRA is a private organisation. So, the other thing, and the last thing, which I'm going to have a gripe about, you know, because 
it's no that's all you can do now there's no there's no point actually i mean i've uh, god knows anyone who knows me knows i tried my entire life to try and get these idiots to see sense but the last thing that they're doing is that they're going to um do supervised brushing in schools right which has all been tried uh they're going to try um the school dentist now my <laughs> My late father-in-law was a school dentist, qualified in 1928. I mean, this is how deep they're, they're dredging the barrel for, <laughs> for ideas. Um, you know, they're really throwing everything at this. and uh, no, But nothing that's ever going to work, you know. So, they, there's also this... Um, link in their minds between toothbrushing and tooth decay which i have you know is very predominant and it was predominant when i qualified and unfortunately it's just as predominant now 40 45 years later which is this link between uh you know brushing your teeth and making sure you don't get cavities now the cav the cavities they're concerned about because <clears throat> and it varies you know they pick an age five or six a lower bound and then pick an upper bound of between 9, 10 or 11 or something and then and then make the statement uh, that you know the, the biggest reason for admission of children to A&E stroke to have GA between the ages of lower bound and upper bound is um, is tooth decay shock horror and uh, So, so they know they've got to do something about decay, but the thing that they choose to do is brushing. And that's because uh, they're told that they can get a very good deal on some very cheap toothbrushes and some very cheap toothpaste from certain manufacturers who, who benefit you know, greatly from government contracts in that respect. And nobody tells them that the amount of decay you get is entirely dependent on the amount of cakes, biscuits and sweets and fizzy drink your stuff in your cake on and therefore a sugar-free diet is all that's necessary now everybody does that you know that was on breakfast telly the other day and that dimwit and diamond said that the reason why kids have got all this trouble with their teeth is because parents don't stand over them and watch them brush their teeth twice a day and in fact I've you know I disclose every single patient that comes in my surgery as you know and I can tell you the parents standing over the children and watching them brush is absolutely no guarantee that any plaque is going to be even mildly disturbed so so they're doing the wrong thing and they're doing it badly as well now I am going to come up with a solution that once I get through this junction okay <laughs> I'm not going to I'm not going to tell you the solution on the way to the hospital in the back of an ambulance. But I am going to tell you the solution as soon as I've turned right. Which I have now done. I should put a roundabout in here because honestly, the people treat it as a roundabout. So what is the solution? Angry you say, what is the solution? And in telling you the solution, and I am going to tell you the solution, I'm going to tell you in less than a minute even because when I'm interviewed on the radio, that's all you've got, about three minutes. In the first minute, they make a few jokes about you being a dentist. Then the second, they have a go at you. And in the third one, they say they're a bit nicer because they have to be balanced. But then on the other hand, everybody loves ripping into a dentist. So they can't let that go, you know. So the solution is this. And it's a bit radical. I know it is a bit radical. But in the other, on the other hand, it's not very radical at all. And it was... Not, and, and it's guaranteed to work and that is just to put everything back how it was at a point when anybody in the country could get an NHS dentist anywhere and the earliest I knew where that was the case was 81 and all through the 80s it worked pretty well I mean I in the 80s I was obsessed with clawback but in fact these days you know I, I would happily accept clawback as a the price for making sure that the profession finished within budget and uh, and uh, didn't cause uh, hernias at the treasury 
Now the the the, the other thing, which would call cause not hernias, hernias and heart attacks at the treasury, is that I think dentists should be restored to the top decile of earnings. I think well, all those years I went to the review body and they had a table in the front of the uh, review body report and it showed where dentists were in relation to everyone else. And we were, you know, 9% of the population earned more than us and 90% uh, of the population earned less than us. Yes, well, that's all very well, angry you say. Well, that's a bit, you know, it's, everyone would like to be in the top decile. You can't just say, oh, you want to be in the top decile. Well, I can, and this is, this is why. First of all, when we were in the top decile, the system used to work. Dentists were well paid, but dentists deserve to be well paid. Why do dentists deserve to be well paid? Because we have to have academic skills, we have to have business skills, and we have to have fine motor surgical skills. And I think you'd be hard pressed to name another job that requires all three of those. That's why we deserve to be paid in the top decile. Now, if dentists were put back in the top decile of earnings these days, there would need to be, <coughs> there would need to be a fleet of ambulances on the way to the treasury to cope with all the hernias and uh, and uh, heart attacks and a fleet of decorators to um, recover the wallpaper where they'd all spat their tea over it and uh, generally clear up the desks, you know, where they'd fallen over and pulled all the stuff onto the floor and got their head jammed into a waste bin. But that, honestly, that, what is a simpler solution than that? Restore us to the top decile of earnings and reinstate the system as it was in about 1982, right? And then what would happen then, right? Well, for a start, it would take at least five years, I think, for everybody to, um, for, for the, the system to right itself, you know, it would heal itself. We will get to the situation where every dentist would be working on the NHS and every dentist would be accepting uh, NHS patients on a fee-for-item basis. <coughs> and you, could, you know, we know, don't we, as a profession, that fee-for-item is the only way for dealing with a backlog. And that's what we have got. We have got a backlog. We've got a backlog that's every bit as large as the backlog that the um, Labour government inherited in 1948 <coughs> of dental disease so the problem with any tweaks to the system that they make now are not they're not like the tweaks that they made during my lifetime during my lifetime the system was pretty much working well or you know well or badly and they just were making small changes, you know, they were sailing along, it was sailing along, and they only had to make small changes to the rudder or to the sails. Now, believe me, they made all the wrong changes, you know, they, they uh, moved the rudder the wrong way, and they set the sails incorrectly for the wind, and then when they appointed this idiot Hurley as CDO, well, that was equivalent to taking the rudder off and throwing it in the sea. And now what they've done is they've, with COVID, they've gone and kicked in all the uh, hull underneath the waterline. So the boat is, is sunk. We're, we're, we're wallowing along <laughs> with only the top one foot out of the water. So it needs to be bailed out. It's not, it, it doesn't just need a bit of, you know, a little sensitive hand on the tiller. It, it needs to bloody great bail out. So, so, you know, they're gonna have to reset and start again. Or accept, you know, which you know, a lot of conspiracy theorists would probably say that their intention was to get, <clears throat> divest themselves of the uh, NHS dentistry and and make everybody go into the private sector. But I don't think so. I honestly think they're 
I, I don't think they're that clever. <laughs> and let's face it, if they were that clever, they'd just still be stupid to think they could do it. No, I think that they literally, they literally think that uh, they got, they've all got this Dunning-Kruger syndrome, which means you get promoted to a, into a job that is <coughs> too difficult for you to handle, and then and that's where you stay, making a mess of things. So next time someone says to you, what's the solution? Say, dentist into the top decile. Quite the thing about academics and business skills and manual skills. And put the system back to how it was in 1982, when everybody in the country could get a dentist. That obviously worked, didn't it, that system? Because everybody in the country could get a dentist. Okay? So that's my uh, that's my reaction, and uh, LBC wasn't interested in that. Well, it's their loss and your gain. Okay, all right. <laughs> nice to talk to you. Bye.